Good afternoon. Uh, I want to welcome you to the first of this uh, OSA series of Key Opinion Leader webinars. Um, uh, we've done uh, very well, uh, and then we actually have 200 people online at the moment. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I've got great pleasure um, introducing uh, Professor Mike Callahan um, as our speaker for today. Um, Mike uh, is a professor of clinical physiotherapy at Manchester Metropolitan University. He holds an honorary fellow post at the University of Manchester uh, at the Centre for MSK Research. He's also an extended scope practitioner, physiotherapist at the Manchester Royal Infirmary. Um, and he's also at the cutting edge of osteoarthritis research, both, as the, uh, both through the research in osteoarthritis Manchester group or Rome group, and is also the, the principal investigator um, for the NIHR funded Prop OA trial, which he'll talk a little bit about uh, in a moment. Um, so what I wanted to do first of all, uh, before we start, is just go through a few housekeeping uh, sort of rules and bits of information for you uh, first of all. Um, so with these sessions, um, the way that you communicate with us um, is through the Q&A function. So with the Q&A, any questions that you want to ask um, of myself or, or Mike um, can go through there. Um, we'll answer those as we go through. Um, there's also a chat function as well. So if you have any instant messages or whatever, um, we will we'll cover those. So I'll be manning that, that chat function uh, while we're waiting. Um, there is also, this is being recorded as well. So this will be available both through osa.co.uk, um, through the Academy section, if you click on webinars uh, in the OSA Academy section. It will also go on the OSA Academy YouTube uh, channel as well. So all of our previous webinars uh, and previous content, also content from other regions uh, within OSA are available on there. We will also send out e-certificates post this session uh, as well. So you can add this to your CPD file or, or whatever you choose to do. So moving on, uh, what I'm going to do is just to, to pass over to Mike um, and then uh, he'll start his talk, which is knee osteoarthritis and physiotherapy. What is the latest? So I'll pass over to you, Mike. OK, I will now start sharing my screen. Thank you very much indeed. I'd just like to say thank you to um, um, both Giles and Stuart for organising this. They are, uh, they've been working very hard behind the scenes uh, to get through all the technical issues and things like that, which um, all surround these things. So the, the idea today was to look at um, the, what is the latest with regard to knee osteoarthritis and physiotherapy? And this is based on some of it's on the work that we've been doing in Manchester and some of it's based on other um, experts um, uh, around the world. Um, the reason that we're involved in Manchester is mainly from a brace perspective um, and so I'm going to talk about some of our work specifically with that. Um, one of the things I think we need to do first is probably on a poll uh, uh, is establish um, the, the type of audience, the, the spread of the audience, is it uh, physiotherapist, is it orthotist, uh, prosthetist and I think there's a, uh, Giles do you want to explain this? Um, so there's just a poll up in front of you. If you can just uh, click on uh, which one applies to you most uh, most of all. So in my case, I, I'm an orthotist, so I click on that and then press submit, and I can see that these are coming coming through. So we'll just give it a couple more seconds uh, with with those, and then I'll just share the results uh, so that you can all see. Okay, that's pretty good. So I'm going to stop there and then share the results. Um, so we have 59% uh, physiotherapist, 27% uh, orthotist, 1% prosthetist, 2% uh, consultant or doctors, uh, and 11% other. Over to you, Mike. Okay, right. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so um, I'm just going to move on to the next slide now. Um, so just to remind us that we have disease of the whole joint. This is the famous diagram which I'm sure you all know and love regarding the normal uh, and the abnormal um, parts of a joint and the thing to remember here of course is that the pathology in the joint is often completely uh, discordant with the symptoms and also discordant with the radiological findings that's another important aspect which I'm sure some of you will already know. Um, the problem with osteoarthritis is that there is no cure and there's no even disease modification. That's why 
Um, and in contrast, in fact, to rheumatoid arthritis, where huge strides have been made with disease modifying drugs that slow uh, and change the course of the disease. Uh, that is impossible with OA, which is why we're still left with many of these modalities that uh, I'm going to, that physiotherapists and other allied health professions use um, during their clinical practice. Um, just to remind us all about nice guidelines, and the reason I'm showing this is not for sake of completeness, but if you notice here on the, uh, if I just go on to this one here, and if you see here, supports and braces are on the outside, shock absorbance or soles and insoles are on the outside, um, but you notice in the core, which is core guys, nice guidelines, are education advice, strengthening exercises, aerobic fitness training, and weight loss if the patient is obese and overweight. And what we're hoping to do in the next few years, of course, is to try and see if these two things on the outside are gonna be moved inwards if we have more and more evidence for that, which is part of the, um, the trials that we're doing in Manchester. So as you can see, there was lots on the periphery, including our old friends, um, NSAIDs and intra-articular steroid injections, joint arthroplasty, but the central here is exercise and advice and, and weight loss. Um, <clears throat> now there has been some research done but not very much on different joints and I'm going to explain where they are in relation to, to the hip. So there are one or two studies being done on hip OA. Um, you can see them here um, by some relatively famous researchers including Kim Benoff from Australia but the problem with these is there are not many and in fact they are not able to uh, include uh, control groups that didn't involve exercise. As you can see here with the interventions on this line here in this row, gait training, multimodal physiotherapy, patient education exercise, and high and low velocity resistance training. But they do show uh, the small amount of evidence in that, that, also, that exercise is beneficial in getting rid of pain. Interestingly, they don't always change the biomechanics of the gait, which is one of the objectives. So to get rid of the pain, we don't always change the biomechanics. The hand always, some of this has been driven by Krizia Zedzig here, who's actually from Kiel University and published in 2015. And she's been a bit of a leading light with regard to um, the re research into hand OA, particularly with the thumb. Uh, and as you can see here, the results of her trial showed that hand exercise and joint protection is effective in medium six month outcomes. So joint protection was in the form of a hand splint on this particular occasion. And now we get to pretty low evidence. In fact, reviews that I did, Duika Shipoff from Erasmus did, and Natalie Collins from Australia in subsequent Aussie meetings was that there are no trials. There has never been a randomized trial on ankle OA uh, and involving what we're gonna to discuss today. And there's only ever been one randomized controlled trial with Hilton Men's from Australia, from La Trobe University in Melbourne. They're looking at orthotics in first MTPJ OA. So a pretty, uh, a pretty, small return for foot and ankle OA. Which brings us to the knee, because with the knee, we have a lot of evidence. Uh, this is the main joint that's looked at, mainly because it's extremely common and it involves a lot of pain, it involves a lot of disability, and that's why it's a huge topic uh, of research in osteoarthritis. What we have to remember is that there are three compartments. I'm judging from the people who are on the webinar today, that will come as no surprise, but we sometimes forget that there are three. So you have, first of all, if I can just highlight this again here, we have the medial compartment here, which is the most commonly affected, the lateral compartment here, and more and more interest has come about with the patellofemoral joint, which you're seeing on the skyline view here, both in terms of the disability and also the pain. And one of the reasons we think, and one of the things reasons we've targeted this particular subgrouping of knee osteoarthritis is because some of the treatments in the past have been misdirected. So a brace that probably typically offloads the medial compartment here, which is perfectly valid, is actually being applied to people whose osteoarthritis lies mostly in the patellofemoral joints. And braces that supposedly tackle the patellofemoral joint have been applied to somebody whose osteoarthritis here lies here in the lateral compartment. So identifying which compartment, which symptoms is paramount to the research we've been doing the last few years in Manchester um, and also is now driving other people's uh, type of research as well. So where the fact there are three compartments is not just an anatomical knowledge, it is actually very important for us to try and direct the treatment better. And then we have the research into osteoarthritis group that Giles briefly mentioned there as our 
real ago. The famous joke was that Rome wasn't built in a day, but uh, that's that's the best of the jokes, by the way. Um, and so we have here um, uh, tibia, uh, patella femoral osteoarthritis. We have here tibia femoral osteoarthritis. And in here, we also had arthritis that was more inflammatory in nature. And we were able to subdivide the patients and start subgrouping them accordingly, according to x-rays and to symptoms, then we were able to target the treatment better. And that was our, that's our raison d'etre really in Manchester as we were working on it. Now the problem is that, why don't you just give them all a knee replacement? Um, and that isn't as simple as it sounds because even with very conservative estimates, it's about a 20% dissatisfaction rate with total knee replacement. There was a study done a couple of years ago published in the JBJS or the Joint Bunk Journal as it's called now and th that was looking at 20%. So there's still a lot of people who aren't satisfied with total knee replacement. So that's not the whole answer. So that's why these types of treatments that we give are still very important for patients with knee osteoarthritis because they're just replacing the joint doesn't seem to be the whole answer either. So what I want to do is look at three things, exercise, I want to look at bracing, and I also want to look at insoles and orthotics. And that is to say, in shoe orthotics, not, not external orthotics. And so the first question, the first we're gonna look at is exercise. And I think there's a poll coming up now, uh, which Giles is gonna uh, conduct. Uh, and do you wanna read that out, Giles, or should I? Um, so the, the poll is, do you believe that further trials are needed to prove the benefits of physiotherapy in the treatment of osteoarthritis? Um, so it's either a yes, no, or a not sure. I believe one or two of you are having problems with seeing the polls uh, with a browser. I think for next time, um, if you install uh, the app, these will, will, will come up a little bit better. So I'll leave it up for a little bit longer. We have um, about just so about 60% of the, the people responded so far. I'll leave that up for another 10 seconds. Okay, so we have 85% people uh, have answered. So I'll end that there and then share the results for, for Mike to discuss. Okay, uh, yes, that's, a, that's, an interesting, um, that's an interesting poll. Um, in fact, um, our evidence is, is slightly better than that. And in fact, um, when we get rid of that now, thanks Charles, what we now see is there was a paper published by Verhagen just last year and the title of it, and I've deliberately missed out the last part of the title, says, do we need another trial and exercise in patients with knee osteoarthritis? And this is a, a quite a prestigious journal, osteoarthritis and cartilage. Um, and what they looked at was 400, 42 studies with over nearly 7,000 patients. And what they came up was quite interesting because they said the benefit of exercise has been clear since 1998 when five studies showed consistent results. And since 2010, extra studies actually seem redundant as they don't have to have any effect on the uh, estimates. And in fact, the last bit of the title of that paper was no new trials on exercise in the osteoarthritis. So we can illustrate this a little bit better with a graph that they produced in their paper. And what you can see here, this is a summary of the papers in 1990, in uh, 1992, or summary of all the papers in 96, 97. You notice they went in every year, but more often they were. And these are all the randomized controlled trials done with exercise on knee osteoarthritis. And this is the no effect line. So this shows that none of the treatments, the, the exercise treatment compared to placebo have no effect. And you can see every single trial, all the trials on all the summary of trials are way away from no effect. In fact, around about 0.5, which is a moderate effect size. And as, which is always nice to see, those lines here are the confidence intervals. So as the confidence intervals get narrower and you get further away, you get more confident in fact the exercise trials on knee osteoarthritis show without doubt that exercise is of uh, benefit for those with knee osteoarthritis. So that's quite a powerful um, uh, graph from 1992, and it shows that right up to 2016, um, there were a summary of the papers done in 2016. I've really nailed it now that really, even those, they're, they're redundant now if we need to do them. Um, which is quite reassuring, really, because when it comes to us exercise, people often wonder, is there a different, is there a certain amount of evidence available? And the answer quite bluntly is yes, we have enough, we have enough evidence, so much so that we don't need to do another exercise trial on knee osteoarthritis. 
But the problem is, of course, is what you mean by exercise. And this is a really key thing. And I'm going to just dissect that a little bit for you now. Um, if you look at the, the, the one that was just done by Verhagen, they did specify certain things. So individually supervised exercise are superior to group exercises. And of course, a lot of exercises in, in physiotherapy departments are done as group exercise. If the exercise was supervised by physiotherapists, and I would imagine other clinicians as well, but they were specifically looking at physiotherapists, is a clinically and statistically significant effect intervention in reducing pain compared to no or minimal treatment. Um, the only caveat here, of course, is how on earth do you develop a credible placebo for exercise? And that's always going to be a tough one. Um, so often not you have exercise compared to normal practice or exercise against advice or something like that. That's quite a common alternative and comparable treatment. Um, but finally, no further studies in exercise are needed because additional data just isn't going to change the conclusion that exercise has a moderate effect, has a moderate effect on pain in osteoarthritis of the knee. So that's pretty good evidence. And I think we should be all fairly buoyed up and confident with that. In addition to that, I mentioned this from Carsten Jewell. Carsten Jewell, who wrote this up here in 2013, he is the god of, of randomized controlled trials and analysis. He comes from Scandinavia. And um, he's divided things into aerobic exercise here, resistance exercise, all the trials done here, uh, mixed exercise, which is sometimes called multimodal, and also performance exercise, which is to do with balance and proprioception. And ultimately, you can see here that the line is coming across here to show that exercise uh, reduces pain. But he also had some recommendations. So um, I beg your pardon. And the so from 48 trials, these are quite important. Optimal exercise programs for NeoA should have one aim and focus on improving aerobic capacity or quadriceps muscle strength or lower extremity performance. So what he's saying is don't mix and match, do the aerobic capacity, do the quality of strengthening, or do the lower extremity performance exercise on separate occasions. And in patients with poor aerobic capacity and muscle strength, they should be done on different days to have the best effect. Now the third is quite important. For best results, the program should be supervised, carried out three times a week, at least 12 sessions. Now, I just want you to remember that figure, times three a week, for at least 12 sessions that's for basically for four weeks isn't it and the reason for that is that when i was a junior physio many years ago i'm going to carbon date myself now but i think i think beta max was still out when i was a junior physio and for three times a week it was pretty common for you should see patients three times a week in modern physiotherapy departments in the nhs i can't speak for private in the nhs that isn't done uh, people are seen once a week once every other week uh, and it's the pressures are more and more on the departments to try and cut down the number of times. As far as we know, that isn't very good advice because uh, what Cost and Jewel find out for best results, the program should be three times a week for at least four weeks. Now, the final thing is also quite interesting because often you get conflicting evidence about what type of patient is best for these exercises and what isn't. But the programs seem to have similar effects, regardless of the patient characteristics, including how bad the oh, osteoarthritis was on the x-ray but sometimes patients get are given the false perception that there's nothing that can be done for their knee and the results from Karsten Jules review show that that isn't necessarily the case and the other thing that we're not very good at at all is the exercise dose so exercise works but how much we need to do is not very well known in the musculoskeletal world. And this is a very interesting paper. And in fact, if you read, read some of the texts here, is that inadequate dosing can have negative consequences. And when you think of the analogy with um, uh, rheumatologists and a variety of, of, of physicians and doctors giving out drugs, they know pretty much what you should be giving. And they also, what isn't gonna be much effective. And we do this ourselves. If paracetamol should be taken, you know, one gram four times a day, so that's two tablets. What's the point in taking half a tablet? It's, it doesn't make any sense. And so with, you realize that overdosing and underdosing are both almost as bad as each other. The trouble with overdosing is you can, with drugs, you can kill somebody, but not underdosing is just a waste of time. And it's the same with exercise. So we're gonna to have to have things that are a waste of time and things that are gonna be just too much that the patient can't cope. So there's a nice thing in between. What we tend to do in, in, in exercise, we tend to underdose. And if you read a little bit more of the text here, it says in diabetes and people undergoing chemotherapy in postmenopausal women, we have specific exercise doses in patients. 
but we don't have that in the musculoskeletal field and that's what this review here was set out to do and it gave some interesting um, conclusions that help us considerably when we're looking at patients so the first thing is the there are clinically relevant exercise doses for knee osteoarthritis if you look for them and these are 24 total sessions duration of 8 and 12 weeks again most often are affected with large effect size so they're the ones you're going to have the most benefit for surprise surprise the most common is three times a week so now this sort of mantra is coming round about if you want the best effect do it three times a week for about 12 weeks but more okay. damning than that is the frequency of one time a week is related to no effect so doing it once a week just don't bother because it has no effect so that's a really important thing because that's starting to come more and more into clinical practice Mike, um, in sure. just a, a question from Claire Spear, um, just saying, in light of recent developments, is there any evidence to support remote supervision of exercise? Um, just thinking linked to a three times a week supervised ex exercise, may be more manageable with different technological solutions for supervision, for example. Yeah, that's a very interesting question, Claire. And I think, I think you're right. We, we were already experimenting this before, before social isolation and lockdown, funny enough, um, because we were looking at how you could look at people after total knee replacement uh, remotely, so not bring them into hospital. But you would still do the exercises on a regular basis. That's the key. In fact, every day. But you could then, and what we had, we developed a device that could be attached to the side of the knee that transforms itself into a mobile phone and one tap and the signal, the range of motion of the knee gets sent out to the cloud and then the physiotherapist, the clinician picks it up on the cloud and sees either in real time or downloads later if the, uh, if the patient is doing the exercises correctly. And also means that we can monitor how well they're doing and also how well they're not doing. If they're starting to regress, then we need to know why. So it's a very interesting point. I think it can be done remotely. I don't think that uh, it's, it's not necessarily being face to face. It's knowing that you're being supervised on a daily or a three time weekly basis. There was also another comment um, from Marcus Bill just saying that that potentially physio directed personal trainer sessions could be a useful uh, tool uh, yeah. in, in that as well. Yeah, 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 I agree, Marcus. Yeah, yeah. It's the frequency and the, the level of supervision that seem to be key in this. And was, was there any guidance on the length of uh, that each session should be? That was a question from Clara Chandler. Um, there isn't to be anything yet. I've got some data regarding walking as an exercise, and I'm going to show that on the next slide or two. Um, regarding, we're also very not, you're right, we're not very good at saying, well, uh, do you do 30 repetitions, do you do 50 repetitions, do you do 25 repetitions? Again, it varies so much. We're not very good at that as physiotherapists, as clinicians, as AHP clinicians. I don't think we're very good at that yet. Uh, and something that's uh, uh, more than we need to look at, I agree. Okay, great. And the, la the last question is just uh, regarding escape pain uh, from Nicola Parfit and just saying yeah. that those are based on two, uh, two times a week for six weeks. Um, yeah. yeah, escape was a slightly different thing. And I know Mike Hurley, who did that, uh, th that's a very successful program. Um, and I just can't remember, I, I think, I think, don't know if Carsten Joel actually had escape pain in his review or not, I'm not sure. But it, it was, a, escape pain was a very successful program. Um, but now that the escape pain has been done and dusted and these things are, are, are the latest pieces of evidence about what needs to be done. <clears throat> okay. Thanks for those questions. Very interesting questions. Thank you. So when it comes to going on now about maximum tolerated doses and, and uh, as I say, the thing about dosing is we're, we're getting slightly better, but there's still lots of holes and gaps in our knowledge. This was looking at walking and it gave us the first indication of just how much you could ask a person to walk and what would like to be a benefit and wasn't. So in other words, what's the walking dose? And you can see here there's three different things, pain, uh, activity uh, limitation and also stiffness of the knee. And you can see these are, are curvilinear. So what that means is you don't start here and as you do more and more and more and more and more, the pain gets better and better. And better. Well, actually, pain comes from there, isn't it? From top down. So as you do more and more and more and more, the pain gets better and better and better. That's not what happens. It starts off here. As you start to do the walking dose, the pain gets better, gets better, gets better. And then there's a sweet spot and it starts to get worse again. And the same with uh, walking dose and activity and the same with stiffness. These are not linear straight lines. The more you do, the better you get. There's an element of dosage 
control that you have to do. And in fact, and summarize that for you, because they looked upon the maximum tolerated dose of around about 70 minutes per week, and all, not, not per day, go on, I'm it, and I don't think I do 70 minutes per day. And also that has to be on top of normal activity. So this isn't just 7,000 steps a day, this is 7,000 steps walking on top of normal activity. It's about it's about it's about three miles. It's it's nearly five thousand meters. Um, Ninety nine steps per minute, and the average walking speed of about two point five miles per hour. So the normal jaunty walking speed is only about three. So it's just less than that. And that was the sort of guidance, the first guidance that we had regarding maximum tolerated dose and using walking as a treatment in itself. And then uh, in addition to that, uh, just to say how powerful this can be, uh, Ross Wilkie was a, I remember Ross who worked with him many years ago in Liverpool. He's now working up at Keele University um, with, uh, with this chap here, George Pete, who I know well. And they were looking at, not only was osteoarthritis an exercise important, so osteoarthritis actually can predict mortality. It's quite as powerful as that. But more important than that, they said encouraging people to walk frequently or to get out and about, that was their phrase, is important for reducing mortality as well as targeting the symptoms of OA. So walking and encouraging people to walk frequently has actually got just as much as getting rid of the pain or improving the pain and stiffness in the OA actually also helps reduce mortality. Mike, um, there's been a question. Do, could you just quickly clarify dose of walking? What, what, what does that represent? Um, so yeah, so let me go back. Oh, sorry, let me go back on that a second, if I may. So that's the I, I've gone through the paper, and I, I first read this um, a couple of years ago. It was very interesting how we were able to look at this. It was presented at the World Congress, if I remember rightly. So that's 70 minutes walking per week, but it's not. They've actually been a little bit more specific about that, and, and that broken down there exactly what that constitutes in terms of um, in terms of walking per week. Right, so that, that allows, a, allows you to direct uh, limits, upper limits in terms of what, what can be done. Correct, Should yes, you? yes. And, 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 and the beauty about it now is, I mean, there are so many devices to be able to count steps and these sort of things that it's, it's no longer a, um, it, it's not a completely unattainable thing. You know, every, there's iPhones and all sorts of devices that um, grandchildren are buying, grandmothers and nieces are buying aunties and things like that so that's why i think this is very useful because this thing these sort of directives and these parameters can be calculated very accurately by patients now <clears throat> thanks for that so finally there was another thing that came out in the same year actually as the the paper by wallace and this was looking at walking exercise houses at work and as you can see here on the right hand side, the diamond shows that favoring exercise, all these trials were coming out in total, total distance walked. The time spent walking, uh, you increase as it favors exercise as opposed to control. And also the gait velocity also improves if you're exercising. So walking is often regarded as, oh, that's not really exercise. It's actually a very important modality for us to advise patients on what to do. So if the patient doesn't want to walk, <laughs> what else can we do? What other forms of exercise do we have? Well, we have, it's quite good news, really. We have, you can choose lots of things. Not as much evidence behind these as walking, but Tai Chi, for example, uh, some aquatic and hydrotherapy can be done. That was a Cochrane review. There's a short term, small positive effect on NeoA. Swimming has actually been looked at to be protective to of osteoarthritis if it's done before a certain age. Electrical stimulation, less exciting, really. If you add that to stimulation, if you add that to exercise, it doesn't really work. So you better just do enough doing the exercise without the faff of the electrical stimulation. And also a recent paper in, done in cycling um, showed that these three things, the Coos pain, the VAS, the six minute walk test, and the Womack pain, these were all clinically and statistically different compared to the, uh, compared to the control group. So, and these were twice weekly supervised sessions I think they were even done on, these might have been done remotely actually, um, using exercise bikes indoors. Uh, and there again, it was for a 12 week period. So that transfers to pain with knee osteoarthritis. Um, interestingly enough, what they did there was they, they managed to 
exclude those who had patellofemoral osteoarthritis. That's a very interesting biomechanical concept because the patellofemoral joint does take a, a lot of whack from, that's a technical term obviously, uh, takes a lot of whack from um, cycling um, because of the patellofemoral joint reaction forces. Um, so you just have to be a wee bit careful. They only apply that to patients with tibiofemoral osteoarthritis. So there is a bit of choice for other people if they don't fancy doing walking. We have other evidence of other types of exercise and its benefit. Um, okay. The other thing that I think patients, patients often ask, or even those who have injured themselves often ask, is does running cause knee OA? And this is some work done down at um, University of British Columbia down here, the logo here, with Jean-Francois Escoulier, who's a French-speaking uh, Canadian physiotherapist. And they came out with this informatic and um, the running might have a protective effect. Runners have a 54% lower chance of knee surgery due to osteoarthritis than none. And if you look here in the center, you see three out of 10 recreational runners will have knee OA. If you don't do anything, you're gonna get more. There's more chance of getting knee OA. So it's 10 out of 100. So too little exercise likes to have it. But if you go too far, that is also going to be uh, let you have more chance of having knee osteoarthritis. So again, there is a sweet spot in the middle. All your recreational runners um, can are actually in the perfect environment. And this, of course, blows out of the window the idea that, oh, you should rest your knee, you don't want to let it go. And, and people not quite explaining how they've never really done any exercise or any injury. So how can they have knee OA? It's, we know that sedentary people can get it as well. Um, more interestingly, this has just came out this year, the odds of getting osteoarthritis are twice as likely if you play sport when you're injured compared to those who did not. So this is a very important caveat, just to ask the patients, if they're particularly in the, say, the late 50s and so on, and they're still quite active, playing sport when you're injured is not a great idea. And that's probably where a little bit of the confusion comes with people saying well yeah I've, yeah i didn't really get injured or i've only got injured once or i'm not sure where my knee pains come from it's this that seems to be driving it as well this is an informatic produced by jackie whitaker and eva roos uh, and they were looking at the risk profile for sports related after injury and you can see it's lots of colors and things a bit confusing the two things here in red are looked upon as high risk uh, and the trouble with the ones in red is they are non-modifiable factors. So joint, if you've got an altered joint uh, structure, then that's not modifiable. And if you've had an injury, you, that's it, you, your cards are marked. So these things here are actually modifiable factors, particularly things like poor diet, uh, obesity and adiposity, uh, fear of movement. These are modifiable factors to uh, decrease the risk of sport-related um, knee OA. Okay, so that's exercise. So there's a lot of evidence for exercise and that is um, extremely, um, it, it, it just fills me a lot more confidence and extremely reassuring for clinicians that exercise, if we do it correctly and we know something about the exercise dose and the type of exercise you can do, the patients will benefit from it and having the confidence to be able to tell them that. So the one piece of advice that they used to be given years ago was just, oh, don't do that, you know, wrap yourself in cotton wool. We know that that's not good advice at all. Which brings us now to the second thing, which is braces, or which are braces. Um, uh, we can come to the, uh, do you want to come to that in a second, uh, Giles? Yep. Yep, thank you. Um, so <laughs> we'll we'll just talk about, you see, it's okay, you, you, we're nearly there actually, it might be the next slide I think. So as mm -hmm. you can see, the, the trouble is there are a myriad of braces, this is the osso brace on the right hand side here, um, there's a lot of them about, and the question is, um, how beneficial are they for knee osteoarthritis? And that brings into some of the research we've been doing directly and primarily in Manchester. Um, why would braces be helpful? Well, there's two main reasons. One on the left is the biomechanical reason. So this is the uh, ground reaction force of the knee adduction moment. And that should be actually going through the middle part of the medial compartment of the knee joint there. And you can see the distance there is quite large. If you reduce that and you get less knee valgus, that's gonna go exactly where it should be and therefore the strain on the knee will be less. And the idea of bracing is that there's some, you can able to reduce that to some extent uh, and therefore reduce the strain uh, on the knee. The second thing is proprioception. 
and all braces have that capacity. I mean, even tubic has that capacity, but all braces um, of any sort have that capacity to be able to improve proprioception. So this was a trial uh, that we did a few years ago now, looking at specific patellar femoral osteoarthritis, which was becoming more and more obvious to us that it was an important source of patients' pain and was actually clouding our judgment regarding which type of brace to give people. And often patients were given the wrong brace. And ultimately a lot of trials were being done with not separating patients and screening them accordingly so that they got the right brace. So we did um, a, a random allocation to either immediate brace or delayed brace. That was part of the trial uh, methodology. And ultimately all patients received this brace, which was at the time was made by OSSA. And it was, this was made of lycra. So this was ultra thin, uh, much thinner than neoprene, and therefore a lot of acceptability from the patient's perceptive. This little C cuff here could be taken on and off. Um, it was not an essential part of the trial, but it was there nevertheless. 126, this is the largest ever trial done on patella femoral OA. And as you can see the demographics there, the mean age is 55, which is slightly younger than patients with medial compartment OA. And they had quite a lot of pain, um, over six centimeters on the visual analog scale. Uh, and they were worn for about 7.3 hours a day. And we had a very low attrition rate. I'm not gonna take the glory for that. That was due to my excellent research team. Um, but that's a very, very low attrition rate compared to a lot of other trials that we had in the, seen in the past. So the braces, as I say, were worn for 7.3 hours a day. And in fact, we then got a first indication. Remember, I'm not quite obsessed with dosage, but it's something we neglect and very poor at. And we actually found out that if you lengthened your amount of time that you wore the brace for one hour a day, you was a, there was a, 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 that's, that's a, that's a decrease in, uh, not an increase, an improvement, as I meant to say there, an improvement of one millimeter on the Vagilonic scale for one hour worn. So there was actually a dose dependency. People often said, well, do, do I work for three hours, do I work for six hours? And at the end of the trial, we could say, actually, the longer you wear it for a day, there's a chance that there's a very, very good chance that in fact the pain will decrease more for the longer you wear it. And this was the first time ever really that there'd been some indication on brace trials that dosage and the length of time you wore it was uh, quite important. These are the results. So we were able to change the pain uh, to 12 uh, uh, to uh, 16 um, millimeters, which was clinically significant. These also changed as well, but you'll notice here that the uh, a functional test, the aggregated local muscle function test was just outside uh, statistical significance. But this one here, the pain, which is the primary outcome measure, was clinically and statistically significant between having a brace and not having a brace. This was at six weeks. And then we also had the chance using MRI to look at the concept of bone marrow lesions. I'm gonna show you some pictures in a second. Because what we were able to show was in this particular brace, patellofemoral bone marrow lesions decreased significantly. There was a big change compared to one on the other. The tibia femoral didn't change. Uh, so this was now an idea that we had that the brace was actually specific to the patellofemoral joints. Now here's the bone marrow lesion. I've shaded it in red here, just so you can see it, but you, you, you should be pretty eagle-eyed to spot that, I would say. And this is on the T2 weighted image. Uh, and there is also, you see, there's also a, um, a lesion there in red on the patella femoral, on the patella. But never forget the fact that the femur is just as much part of the patella femoral joints as the patella. And here you can see over a 12 week period, there's a, there's a lesion there. That's at six weeks and that's at 12 weeks. And you can see there, I'm sure you can see the decrease in bone marrow lesion size that was related to a decrease in pain over that 12 week period. And here it is on the skyline view, baseline, six weeks, 12 weeks. And you notice there the patella femoral, sorry, the, the femoral lesion has gone completely over that period of time. So this was uh, one of the ideas that um, we had about bone marrow lesions contributing to pain, specifically in the patella femoral joint, and that's what we were able to prove with this particular brace in this particular condition. And interestingly, it had no effect on the, any lesions in the tibial femoral joint. So patella femoral brace significantly improves pain and symptoms in painful patella femoral joint OA, and then we also found an actual fact that the patellofemoral joint was 
specific symptom assessments. So we were able to use a thing called the nominated activity. So we actually asked patients, what's the thing that gives you the worst pain? Is it going upstairs, going downstairs? Is it squatting? Is it walking? Is it running? What is it? And then patients were able to report back to us specific to their activity that was bothering them the most, rather than just saying pain in the last week. So we think that using a patient specific assessment was also quite important for us. Um, Mike, just a, a couple of questions with regard to those couple yeah. of slides. Um, yeah. So one from MD Shafi. Um, if the bone marrow edema noted on the tibia, uh, if there's bone marrow edema noted on the tibia, which is commonly in OA, would a brace help? Uh, well, it's not been done yet on um, tibial femoral OA. Um, uh, that's the that's the short answer. Um, I think somebody was trying to. I knew there was a trial in the pipeline on, on the new trial, which I'll describe at the end. We aren't doing MRI because it's it's not that type of trial, and we haven't. The, the funders won't allow us to look at the mechanism behind the pain. They just want to know if it gets less painful or not. Um, but I believe there was one study that's been the protocol for it, but I haven't seen anything done on the tibia femoral joint as such. Um, there's a couple of questions, one from David Barton and Sun Idle Jane, um, just saying effectively a very similar question, but wouldn't naturally the, the bone marrow edema improve? Was there a control group in that trial? Yes, there was a control group and that was, that was different from the control group. Absolutely, yeah. So that was brace versus no brace in the same condition. But it's an interesting point you make because we know that bone marrow lesions do wax and wane. So over a period of time, uh, they don't increase steadily, steadily, steadily like an x-ray would, because an x-ray will always get worse over a period of time. It will never get better. It could stay the same, but it will never get better. But what noticed previous researchers, particularly in Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, in Sydney, they've noticed that the bone marrow lesions wax and wane. Now, that might explain why osteoarthritis symptoms wax and wane, and yet the x-ray findings are either the same or worse. So the x-rays never get better, and yet the bone marrow lesions do get better. What we were trying to prove over a short period of time was that we could manipulate that. You don't have to wait for that to happen. Can we manipulate that and change it for the better? That was the premise of the trial. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That's an interesting question. So the, the, the next question we need to say, well, how does that happen with a brace? How can a brace change bone marrow lesions? That's a sort of follow on to what we've just been discussing. And this was a paper we produced um, a year or so later. Uh, looking at the knee brace because we thought that it might alter the patella position and we used weight bearing MRI so we're looking in Manchester have a weight bearing MRI um, it's 0.2 Tesla but it's, it's still pretty good um, and we would this is it here so that's lying and standing and then what we were able to do then was look at these variety of measures which are pretty standard x-ray measures um, people have been looking at this for many years including the bottom one patella femoral contact area and they are they are here and this one on the top right here this is the contact area and we were able to show that in fact the brace does alter improve and increase the contact area and the reason that's important is that and i don't think i can demonstrate it on here but it, if you have your thumb resting on a desk for a couple of minutes and the, the thumb can become quite painful if you have your hand and the palm resting on the desk you've spread the you've spread out the contact area and so it there's more there's less stress being taken on a focal point and we think this is one of the reasons why bracing particularly patellofemoral bracing might be helping and might be decreasing bone marrow lesions because bone marrow lesions are a response to mechanical stress both in the acute after an acl injury but also in the in the chronic after chronic stress which is what we think the patellofemoral joint was doing so this is one of the reasons why we went on to investigate to see if this was the case and using this particular measure we found that it was. With regards to investigations into OA, um, Nathan yep. Korn um, is just asking, what is the best uh, investigation for OA? Is, is it MRI? Well, it, it depends, Nathan, it depends what you want to look for. I mean, I'm sure you know as well as I do that MRI can give you a whole host of stuff that's totally irrelevant to what the patient's experiencing. Um, if you're looking for bone marrow lesions, yeah, it's MRI. And it doesn't have to be gadolinium enhanced. It can just be a pretty, standard in inverted commas uh, MRI scan using, using the dark to T2 weighted images will give you bone marrow lesions. The problem with, um, oh, uh, with, with osteoarthritis and MR scans is that there's a whole host of things going on and it really just depends what you want to be looking for. Like you'll always find a degenerative meniscal tear. 
It's particularly if you're looking for it. The question is, is that the cause of the symptoms and what are you going to do about it? So I think it's a very important point that you raise about investigations uh, and a lot of GPs now have access to MR scans rather than x-rays and people are saying well you're better having that instead of having x-rays because they're more sensitive and that is true the question is is it too sensitive for what you're wanting to do with osteoarthritis um, but with bone marrow lesions it's MR all the time okay and with regards to um, those investigations is there a phrase that Dunlop asked is there cause and effect between the severity of lesion and the severity of the pain. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. We, we've been looking at that and seeing that the size of the bone marrow lesion is related to it. It looks as though it might well be, yeah. Um, I think we published something a couple of years ago on this. I haven't put it up here today. Um, and uh, based on some early work we did, and I know David Felsen from Boston has done a lot of work on this in the past. But yeah, the size of the lesion seems to, bone marrow lesion seems to be related to the, the amount of pain, uh, which is a little bit different from your plain radiograph, the plain x-ray, sometimes that's a bit misleading, isn't it? You, sometimes you see patients and you think, well, there's not too much um, osteoarthritis on that x-ray, and yet you know, they're in real trouble, they're in severe pain. Uh, and conversely, people with really lousy, almost grade four kelgren lawrence osteoarthritis are quite satisfied with you know, paracetamol and getting on with it. So I saw someone in clinic before the shutdown, I saw someone in clinic um, and uh, they had exactly that. They said, well, I'll see you in a year's time. Yeah, yeah I've, I've certainly seen plenty of experiences where you, you see uh, a horrific x-ray or whatever and then the patient wanders in and they're comparatively okay. It's, That's right. It That's right. Yeah, it's, it's a solitary um, lesson for us all, yeah. Um, and, and Paul um, Hegenbath uh, is asking, does the evidence base for bracing fit into the ESCA guidelines for management of meniscal pathology sort of pre-OA? Yeah, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Um, uh, 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 bracing for meniscal pathology, uh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't answer that, to be honest. I, I'm not sure. I'm not very au okay. fait with, the, with, with the, the effect of bracing on, on meniscal pathology, it, unless it degenerates. I mean, I don't, does it mean, I'm not sure if it means acute or, or chronic meniscal pathology there. Okay, we'll, we'll perhaps come back to that one. Come um, back to uh, that, yeah. Yeah, and uh, are there any studies looking at exercise effects on bone marrow lesions at all? And that's from Debbie Simpson. No, that's a good point, actually. We have a trial at the moment looking at uh, depot injections of a drug that was used for osteoporosis rather than exercise. Um, and so the, the, the depot, uh, so the idea is that bone marrow lesions may be related to the same pathological process as osteoporosis. Um, it was one of the theories behind it. And so patients were getting a depot of uh, a drug called denezumab. Uh, that was that's being done in Manchester right now. Well, it was until we got shut down. But um, so they were injecting one injection, I think one injection a month. That was all it was um, of denezumab to see if that would have an effect on the bone marrow lesions. That's what we're investigating right now. But nothing I've ever seen on exercise. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. Um, okay. So the next one is now is I think this is our third poll. Um, and I just wanted to ask this question. This is, uh, I make no bones saying, this is Oscar's latest patellofemoral brace. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and this is, do you believe, and this is a very important clinical question, do you believe that bracing would inhibit muscle function? Uh, and there's a, there's a very good reason for asking this. So. so we've got about 50% of answered so far. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> I'll just leave it going for another 10 seconds and then sure. we'll stop. Nearly 80%. <clears throat> oh, wow. <clears throat> okay, I'll stop it there and then share that now. Okay. Ah, well done. You're bright. You're a bright lot. Um, one of the reasons that we had trouble initially recruiting and um, patients is that and this has been going on since, as I say, since I was qualified in black and white TV, is that patients are not given braces. And this is not only to the knee, it's also to the ankle mainly and, and, and other joints, but mainly the knee and the ankle. Is that someone somewhere or they read somewhere and years ago, you didn't, they didn't have the internet, so it wasn't as bad, but somebody read somewhere that bracing, well, that'll make your muscles weak. It'll take the place of the muscles. The muscles won't, won't be doing their job properly. And it's a common mantra you hear quite a lot, 
Um, and one of the reasons we were uh, having difficulty recruiting some was because the doctors were saying a, a variety of disciplines, it could be GP, it could be orthopedics, it could be rheumatology, were, were advising patients, well, I don't think you should be doing that because, you know, it might make your muscles weak. And so we wanted to just see this. And I looked down to it and I, there wasn't a single piece of evidence, single piece of evidence um, to confirm or deny this. So we did an investigation on this. Um, and this was the um, report that we did eventually. Um, there was the effect of knee brace on cortisol strength and inhibition, because inhibition is a slightly more complicated assessment, but it's quite neat to do, looking at the patients with patella femoral OA. Um, and in fact, um, our results match your poll, because in fact, we found that braces didn't make the muscles weak. So let me explain this graph. So on here, we have the maximum voluntary contraction at week zero when they first started wearing the brace. And this is at week 12 when they finished wearing the brace. And you can see, not only did the braces not make the muscles weak, it actually slightly improved them. This one here is inhibition. So now as VMC goes up, inhibition logically and physiologically should come down. So once again, zero, six weeks and 12 weeks. So they mirror each other perfectly. And uh, ultimately we were able to prove, and this is the first time evidence ever, that braces don't make your muscles weak. In fact, they make them slightly stronger. And also they, there's less inhibition in the muscles. So you're recruiting more motor units. Now the reason, now, so the question now is why is that? Okay, and it, it's a relatively simple answer uh, that we eventually worked out from asking patients. And they said, well, I, I'm, you know, I'm making, I'm, my knee feels more confident, I feel more secure, and there's an element of proprioception about that. It feels more stable, and I feel as though I can use it more. And what was happening was, because the brace was having all those effects, it was making patients use their knee more. And as they use the knee more, then uh, instead of favoring the other side, then they start, the muscles start to function more normally. And after 12 weeks, you find that in fact, they've started to improve their muscle uh, force. Uh, um, well, actually, that's muscle talk, it's Newton meters, and then also their inhibition has gone down. Okay, that so kind of goes in hand with Amy Williams' question. Uh, was, was there an exercise component with this um, that could have affected muscle strength? Well, we, just, we didn't say to patients you should go and exercise, we didn't give them an exercise regime, we just said to them go and do your normal activity, whatever you do, and you need to wear the brace. So we were quite explicit, this wasn't an exercise trial, it was a brace trial, and we had periods uh, with the brace on and the brace off. So we had a control group uh, at either time point. Yeah. Okay. So that's quite, uh, that was quite useful evidence because then it gave us the confidence then to be able to say to patients, right, these won't make your muscles weak. This is actually a good chance you might get slightly stronger. And that's been the advice I've given in clinical practice ever since. And it probably also gets applied to things like tubergate, elastic bandage, anything like that. Um, because even that gets accused sometimes of making patients muscles weak and it just it just doesn't do that we have the evidence for that so that was quite uh, uh, quite useful in terms of uh, translated straight back into clinical practice and the other thing we wanted to know from the brace point of view was what happens to the bone marrow lesions of the pain if you take the brace away now you might think this is a bit cruel but the way in which the, um, the, the design of that particular trial was done was that we had a period of time when people at the end didn't, they knew they were gonna do this, they didn't wear the brace. Uh, and they were people who happened to do well with the brace. So we knew they were getting better, the pain was going, the bone marrow lesions were getting down, their inhibition was getting better. And then we took the brace off them for six weeks to see what would happen, um, which sounds awful, but it's all part of the deal. So we found that this happened. So I'll just talk you through this, because it's, it's a bit, it looks a bit weird, but it, it's, it's quite easy to see. So the pain on the nominative activity with the VARs is in red. So at baseline, they're up here. Remember I said they were nearly seven, they were 6.6 .6 or something like that as a, as a mean. The first week, they wear the brace, they come down, and then they come down to 12 weeks, and the brace is removed, and look what happens to the pain. It goes up again. But that's a subjective measure. Now, if you look at the two objective measures, uh, which are with the one objective measure, sorry, let's go with the coos pain. The coos pain follows the same thing, but it's, it mirrors the VAS because with coos pain, this sort of funny little looking line here, that is actually also getting better. The coos pain, ironically, or it goes, actually goes up. It's, it's getting better, not coming down. And when the brace is removed, it then dips down, which means that's getting worse. 
So VAS gets worse by going up and the coos pain gets worse by going down. Now, you, you might well seem to think, well, what's going to happen is that when you remove the brace, but look what's happening to the bone marrow lesion. The bone marrow lesions are continuing to go down. They're actually continue to improve after the brace has been removed. Now, this is a classic example of the nocebo effect. So the patient knows that something's going to happen. And so they automatically think, well, I'm going to get worse. But the subjective measure here was the bone marrow lesions. They continued to improve. So this was what happens when you take a brace off somebody. They might actually get worse. But the subjective, they subjectively will get worse. Objectively, it continues to improve. And nobody really ever found that before because rather good question, why would you take a successful treatment of somebody? But we had the wherewithal within the design of the study to be able to do that. Okay, so that's braces. Any more questions on braces, Giles, do, before we move on to insoles, finally? Um, Sarah Wilson asked, how long did the patients wear the brace uh, for in a day? The average length of time was 7.3 hours. Okay. Um, um, is there, Matthew Long's asked, what is the role of bracing in, in encouraging unhelpful pain behavior? Has this been looked at? No, it's an interesting point. We didn't look at that, but you can see where that would be a useful thing to study, particularly with proprioception and patients saying to us, and we, the trouble is, unfortunately, we didn't really measure this. It came as a bit of a surprise to us as patients came back and they kept using the word stable, secure, more confident. And we kind of wish that we, we'd logged that and asked them a bit more, a bit more scientifically. But time and time again, the case, so it was clear that they were changing the pattern of pain. But actually, things like fear avoidance, we didn't measure that. Okay. Um, <coughs> sorry, there's quite a few come through. Um, Christopher Waits asked, was there a difference in bone marrow lesion between the study and control groups? I believe we've already covered that. Yeah, there were, yeah, yeah. Um, were the braces given back afterwards? Um, yeah, after yeah, yeah, we, we, we weren't that cruel. We, uh, we actually uh, we, uh, gave them some new ones, I think, also were generously, generously offered us uh, <laughs> braces. So we were able to resupply them. And actually, we were able to resupply them during the trial in case they got a bit ropey, which some of them did, a lot of them did because they wore them for quite a period of time. Okay, I think that's it for now. We'll come back to the other ones perhaps at the end. Sure. So the final thing that we can do as clinicians is also, and there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of mixed messages regarding the use of insults or orthotics. I've used the terms interchangeably, just forgive me if I use orthotics. I always, when I talk about orthotics, I always mean something inside the shoe. So it means an insole or something inside, or an in-shoe orthotic, I suppose, is more, is more correct. And this was a, um, a study that was done and presented to the World Congress a couple of years ago, where the, um, a colleague of ours here, Rich Jones, is professor of biomechanics at, um, at uh, Salford University, just down the road. Uh, and this is part of our group anyway. Rich works with our group. And this was a thing to look at. Can you predict those who will do well? So responders. So those who will do well and those who won't do well with a lateral wedge insole in patients with medial knee OA. Because the idea of an insole is that it will change the alignment of the knee just as a brace will do, but you're doing it by changing the stress on the foot. Now, this little graphic here is very interesting, and I'm going to blow that up now, because it shows that if you give, every, all these patients had medial knee OA, okay, and the strain on the medial knee OA, to put it bluntly, is measured, and biomechanics get very twitchy, but we can say that it's, it's, it's covered by the external knee adduction moment, because that tends to get worse, the more knee valgus gets worse, which is mean you become more bow-legged, essentially. And we wanted to see what happened to that ECAM, uh, so the knee valgus, with the lateral wedge insole, as reported from a change, as opposed to a control condition. So you have a responders, so they do very well. Their, their external knee adduction moment changes for the better dramatically. But look at here, there's a whole load of people who don't. They, we class them as non-responders, and yet they have the same knee condition. So this was getting very baffling to us, as there were responders and there were non-responders biomechanically to the wedge insole. And as a result of that, this is why people were saying the lateral wedge insoles are ineffective in the improvement on pain and function on medial knee OA. So there was lots of mixed messages coming about. A thing that biomechanically should work wasn't working biomechanically. And what's more, was not having an effect on pain and function. 
So there was something not quite right about this. And yet, biomechanically, the idea of putting a lateral wedge to offload the medial compartment made perfect biomechanical sense. So we decided to do this trial. Uh, this was the efficacy of a lateral wedge insole for pagal, I beg your pardon, painful neosteoarthritis after pre-screening. So this is where the difference comes with this trial, because you had to have somebody uh, extremely charismatic, very good looking, extremely expert to be able to do the screening. Unfortunately, we couldn't get that person, so I had to do it. And that's me, they're examining somebody somewhere. And what I was looking for here is to make sure that these patients had tibia femoral pain, tibia femoral OA, but nothing in the patella femoral joint. And the second thing I had to make sure is that their foot hadn't already pronated. I'm using the word pronate in the general terms now. I'm sure there's one or two uh, podiatrists who might sort of, oh, I'm not so sure about that, but foot pronation. In other words, the, uh, the, the medial side of the, of the arch was moving down towards the ground. Foot pronation, as you would call it. And the reason for screening for these two was because we wanted to make sure that the tibia femoral joint was being affected and it wasn't being affected by the patellofemoral joint because if you give a lateral wedge to somebody with patellofemoral away you actually put increased strain on the patellofemoral joint and increase the symptoms so we want to have patients who didn't have any clinical element or radiographic elements of patellofemoral joint away that's the whole point of trying to do the screening and also that they didn't already have an arch that was closer to a medial arch that was closer to the ground because that's what the lateral wedge insole does anyway so you're going to make this foot position worse and in some cases make it unwearable and there were several patients that we had to screen out because their foot position was already it seemed to me that the foot had already adopted a lateral wedge position naturally by collapsing the medial arch so that's what the idea of this particular trial was and the idea is to change the ground reaction force. This again, by this should then come closer to that by putting a, something on the lateral side of the, of the foot. Then that would decrease the distance between here and here. And this was the Sulfid insole is actually a registered thing. It's, it's available commercially. It was in boots for some time. And it was developed at Salford University in the, the, the podiatry school. So this is the intervention. You have to work for at least four hours a day. And it was a five degree lateral wedge. You can kind of just see it there a wee bit there. How this is the medial arch. And the beauty about this was they maintained a little bit of medial arch support because in previous iterations of this insole, that thing had just tipped over and there was no support for the medial side whatsoever. And they suddenly realized that if you're going to tip it over from this side, you do need some support here. And this is what makes the sulfate insole different from other lateral wedges. And the results, well, yeah, it did okay. <clears throat> the pain came down significantly, uh, both in the last week and also the nominated activity significantly. Now, the reason this was a little bit, and this is compared to a neutral insole, I, I hasten to tell, we put a neutral insole in that was just flat, and compared to that with the significant differences between the neutral insole that acted as placebo or sham and the lateral wedge itself. So the difference here between 4.9 and 5.9 is one or 10 millimeters. The problem is that isn't clinically significant. So it's, it, although it's statistically significant, it wasn't giving people a clinically significant change in pain, although we was moving towards that. Okay, so that was the evidence that we had, I think, published last year on the, infall of la the effect of lateral wedges on medial neo -A. And what you can see here is it was a crossover trial. So you start here with the lateral wedge insole in blue. The pain comes down, this is pain on the nominated activity. Remember that new uh, in assessment that we asked patients to do. It comes down here. They then have a washout period, which is the dotted line. So crossover trials are always stymied by the fact you need at least a number of weeks again of a washout. As you have the washout with no treatment, the pain goes up. They then switch over to the next one, which is the neutral insole in yellow, and the pain continues to go up. Now, if you look here, the patients who started with the uh, neutral wedge, they do have some decrease in pain. There's a powerful placebo effect there. They have the washout period, then they have the true treatment, and whack, the pain comes down considerably. So you can see that just illustrates that there is quite a powerful effect from the, um, from the, uh, the, the lateral wedge compared to the placebo or the neutral insole. So the conclusions from this trial were that there's first time evidence 
the lateral wedge installs are effective in reducing pain immediately away. And I say first time evidence, because I think there have been six trials done before, all of which had been null. In other words, there was no difference from using the uh, lateral wedge install compared to the placebo. Patients pre-screened to select these were likely to respond. So pre-screening and examination of the patient properly was actually quite key. So in other words, you've got near away where this insole is no longer an, a, a valid instruction, just as you've got near away where this brace is also no longer a valid instruction. And finally, the results suggest that this stratified approach, making sure that the patient gets the right type of wedge to the right type of near away, may offer new options for millions of patients with the near away. They were the conclusions of the paper that we had. One final thing is about compliance. Now the clinicians uh, listening in will know exactly what I mean by that. Um, it's patients sometimes play hardball with us regarding compliance. And this paper was produced, for heaven's sake, 19 years ago by Paul Dieppe is a bit of a sort of an iconoclast based down in Bristol, but he's a, he's a, gr he's a great uh, chap. And why don't patients do their exercises? And in fact, they don't do them in exercises because it's very complex. And that's about as complex as it can get. Breaking it down here, the initial compliance is high because the patients have a loyalty to a physiotherapist. Um, they respect their opinion, they respect what they're saying, and so initially they do it. But this is the problem, isn't it? The longer term compliance, as you can see here, if the perception, the perception of the symptoms, severities, the effectiveness of the treatment, it isn't doing the treatment, it isn't doing what it says it's doing, then they're not going to be happy. Fitting treatment into daily life is difficult. Whether or not they have any comorbidities, there might be um having causing problems with the exercise for instance you've got exercise to the way you knee and you've got oa hips as well that might not be great and also depends on the support they get from the physiotherapist so these and we're talking about exercise we're talking about bracing and orthotics but ultimately we can give the best treatment we can if they're not compliant and it's our fault then we're, we're in trouble we're, we're just not treating them properly at all so the conclusion what is the latest that's what the topic has been of the webinar today First thing with exercise, decrease immediate pain in the OA. We don't need any new trials. There is a variable response, but we have now have some guidance on the exercise, the type of exercise and the dosage. The type of exercise isn't vital. There's a variety we can use, but running isn't evil. It's actually quite beneficial, but running when you're injured is, we need to watch that very carefully. Patellofemoral braces decrease pain with patellofemoral OA and they shrink the BMLs in the patellofemoral joint only, and that's related to the decrease in pain. And finally, insoles are dependent on knee, various knee deformity and rear foot position, and the lateral wedge insole for symptomatic knee OA can bring about variable responses, but there is evidence that it is working. Uh, they're the um, three things. And then I think finally, uh, there's what's next in coming up, and this is, the proper way trial, which again has just been stopped by the uh, by the government because all clinical trials have stopped in universities and hospitals at the moment. And once again, the idea of this is to match the brace type to the compartment involved. So we have medial uh, knee OA, we have lateral knee OA, which is the reverse of that brace, and we also have patellofemoral OA. And so all braces are off the shelf. That's one of the um, that was one of the requirements for the, the funder. We have exercise and advice versus exercise and advice and brace. So the ultimate research question is we know exercise works and exercise and advice works very well. It's part of nice core guidelines. What happens if you give them a brace? Will that work any better? Because if it does, then it's worth the effort and the money. If it doesn't, then it's not worth the effort and the money. It's as simple as that. And just one added thing to do with exercise and compliance and brace wearing some of these braces will have an adherence monitor embedded within them, so we'll know what the brace uses was. I think uh, I am now uh, finished, that's my last slide. Um, I think I'm handing over to Giles now, is that correct? Yep. So we're gonna just stop, if you'd stop sharing your screen, Mike, perfect. Let me do that now. So I'm just gonna go through uh, a few of the questions. Thank you very much, Mike, uh, for your talk. We have quite a few. Um, I haven't been able to answer, answer all of them. Um, there was uh, one question uh, from Emma Robertson, um, just saying, has there been a similar study done uh, for perhaps medial wedging for lateral compartment? Oh, no, no, that's an interesting point. No, there hasn't been, um, uh, not, not for lateral OA. I think the reason for that, Emma, is that lateral OA uh, is actually 
quite rare um, compared to medial and patellofemoral and they're the real topics of choice at the moment but I mean logically it'd be very interesting to see it wouldn't it <laughs> Yeah. And is the uh, MD Shafi asked, uh, do insoles work for any degree of medial compartment OA or is there sort of, uh, is it mild to moderate type? Of right, example? yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, I, we've, I can't remember, and that's a bit remiss of me, whether or not people are, we excluded, yes, okay, hang on, come back to me now. We excluded those with severe OA. So in the Kelgan Lawrence, zero to four, you know, zero is no OA, one is doubtful two, three and four, you've got it in a degree of severity and four is kind of almost bone on bone with total loss of joint space. And we excluded four. Zero means you ain't got it, so we didn't have them. One means it's doubtful, so we didn't have them. So we had two and three. So these were for mild and moderate OA changes only. And there have been a few questions about uh, patella strapping uh, and its effect for, for the tenlofemoral OA. What, what are your, your thoughts on uh, patella femoral uh, strapping? Taping. Yeah, I was wondering when the patella femoral question would come in. Um, and it's, we, um, there's, there's some tentative evidence, and it's from a paper that was published, I think, in 1991 um, in the BMJ, for heaven's sake. Um, by a girl called Janet Kushnigan. Again, Paul Dieppe, it was from Bristol. So the chap who is the iconoclast from Bristol was involved in this. And it was the first evidence that we had that there was some sort of taping would work. And they did it specifically on patellofemoral OA. Uh, but since then, there's been nothing. And believe me, we've been trying to do a review of this. And we found that the review wasn't worth doing because there were so few trials. Um, it makes sense. I mean, patellofemoral OA, patellofemoral pain, of course, is quite well researched on this and I think if you're looking at symptoms then I wouldn't particularly hesitate to use patella taping um, and it doesn't particularly need to be any type of tape either so everyone's going to rush around and buy kinesio taping and rock tape but you can you can get away with any type of taping I think logically it makes good sense although from a from a clinical trials perspective there has none been done that I know of I think there's one I saw a protocol recently I think it's been done in Australia you know, but um, at Queensland Okay, um, and uh, there have been a number of questions about whether um, you can use a, a, a brace with lateral wedging as well. What are, what are your thoughts? Have there been any studies on, oh, that's, on yeah, the, uh, a belt and braces job? Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. um, I, 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 I have no idea. I mean, it's it's an interesting thought. I mean, but if you think, yeah, I'm not so sure you're going to get more bang for your buck on that one. Um, I'm not too sure to be honest with you. I mean, I, I suppose there's nothing to stop you from doing it. It's it's not as if you're giving people two different types of tablets that are going to clash with each other and you're going to you know, kill the patient or poison them. It's, um, you can always take one out, I guess, if it's getting too painful. Okay, um, so the, the couple of other uh, sort of questions. Feel free to put, put some more in. What I just wanted to say um, is obviously thanks to Mike for, for doing this session. We'll come back to a couple of questions in a minute. Um, it is important to say that as OSA, uh, we are still fully operational. We're still doing next day shipping. Um, we're aware that a lot of uh, clinicians are um, uh, in hospitals and seeing, still seeing trauma patients, for example. Um, so a lot of these are still available. We have these webinars every week um, on a Wednesday. Um, so for the next three or four weeks, we have a number of speakers, um, including next week, uh, where we have uh, Mr. Ian McDermott, uh, who is a uh, consultant surgeon um, at uh, the uh, the LSO London Sports Orthopaedic uh, in London. So he'll be presenting uh, for us next week at the same time. Um, I'm just going to pop back if you could um, do any further questions uh, that you have on there and we'll try and answer those as many as we can. Um, um, I think um, there was a question uh, going back to you, Mike, um, with regards to adding a lateral wedge. Was there any sort of effect on the medial uh, side of the ankle joint, um, for no, no. example? Yeah, no, it's, it's, that's an interesting point. I think we chose five degree because it was a relatively mild, um, a relatively mild wedge. And I think there is a good point about that. that of course, the first thing we got rid of the the patients who were really quite badly, um, the, the, their foot position was really quite bad and would, would definitely have not have benefited from it. But ultimately, 
I can't remember a single person coming back and saying my ankle's getting worse and it was one of the things that we were watching out for because uh, it would be classed as an adverse event in a, in a clinical trial so we were very cautious about that but I can honestly say I can't remember a single patient coming back and saying that but yeah and I think if you use greater wedges maybe so towards 10 or 11 then which may or may not be possible then I think that's when you would experience that okay and going back to, to very much at the start of the session, uh, you mentioned about 70 minutes of exercise per week. Um, was there any guidance around pain with it? Um, and can that be broken up into individual sessions or, you know, yeah. what, what, what are the guidance yeah. on that? Yeah, it, yes, it could be broken up into individual sessions. And it may well be that, um, you know, you're going to cover the 70 minutes. Some people might do it every day. Some people might do it. I mean, because it's, it's 10 minutes a day, isn't it, essentially? Um, so you might bring break that Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, or something like that. Yeah, but they didn't they didn't do that in the in the trial. So that it, but so you're just going to have to play a bit full loose and fancy free. But the, but they said seventy minutes a week. So they you know they were they didn't particularly and, specify how that was broken up. And in, in that trial, were they were they just looking at patellofemoral um, or tibia femoral, or was it was it was it looking yeah, tibia at femoral, both? Tibia femoral, if I remember right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, I think that is most of the questions. We, we've certainly gone through. There've been lots of requests for your for your reference list. Uh, so <laughs> if I can if I can uh, ask you about that after the session, uh, it really I'll, I'll finish out the end of lockdown. I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you very much, Mike. Uh, thank you very much also for joining us. Um, do look out for the the further sessions as they they come in the coming weeks. Uh, as I said, uh, Mr. Ian McDermott uh, is the next uh, next speaker. Um, we also have a session from, from Neil Jane with regards to shoulders. Uh, and we then also have another session uh, with regards to the hip in the coming weeks. So do look out for those. They'll be on our website. Um, also, uh, as you've registered, many of you will have clicked the, the section that, that means we can, uh, we can send you information about the new ones coming through. Um, so thank you very much for joining us um, and do look out for, for further content as the, the weeks go by.